Um, last night, you might remember, we led this show with news about the former Trump campaign chief, former top White House advisor, Steve Bannon. We reported last night that the controversy um, over, over what exactly he was willing to tell congressional investigators about the Russia scandal, on what basis he was refusing to answer their questions, we reported last night that that controversy might be a bit of a sideshow. Because new NBC reporting indicated that people familiar with the matter believe that special counsel Robert Mueller has essentially stepped in to claim some territory here to stop Steve Bannon from testifying to Congress on Russia matters before Robert Mueller can obtain that testimony from Bannon first. Like the, the theory of the case here is that the special counsel Robert Mueller is basically trying to protect the, the secrecy and, and therefore the integrity of important evidence in his investigation. Nobody except Steve Bannon and maybe his counsel know exactly what Bannon has to say to investigators about Russia involving the Trump campaign or the Trump administration. But Robert Mueller and his prosecutors appear to have stepped in to make sure that they're the ones who will get access to that information before it ends up with members of Congress who presumably would then either leak it to the press or maybe even back to the White House to help the president's legal team prepare their defense for the president if Steve Bannon's got anything important. So that was our, our reporting last night. Special counsel effectively taking action to block Steve Bannon's congressional testimony. That was our reporting last night. Well, then today, Steve Bannon's congressional testimony, in fact, was called off. Um, we don't know when exactly he will be called back to testify to Congress. Congressional investigators say they do still want to speak with him. But it appears to be a pretty good bet at this point that Steve Bannon will end up speaking with Robert Mueller and his investigators in the special counsel's office before he is back on Capitol Hill talking to any members of Congress. Now, the Mueller interview does not have any announced date at this point, but we are told to expect it soon. You know, and, and all of that news, which all unfolded, unfolded over the course of the day today, that's all obviously enough for a whole TV show tonight and more. But then, boom, it happened again. Last week on, on Tuesday, which is incidentally the same date we now know that Steve Bannon got his subpoena from Robert Mueller, last week on Tuesday, Senator Dianne Feinstein of California dropped a proverbial bomb in Washington. Um, back in August, the founder of the firm that had commissioned the Trump-Russia dossier, um, Glenn Simpson, the founder of Fusion GPS, he had testified for about 10 hours at the Senate Judiciary Committee. He testified about that dossier, about its origins, about his firm's role in paying for that, how that information in that dossier eventually made its way to the FBI, etc. Now, although Senate Republicans had initially said they would vote to release the transcript of those 10 hours of testimony, they then changed their minds um, over a period of a few months at a time when congressional Republicans were starting to change course a little bit on the Russia investigations. In the last few months of last year, Republicans in Congress increasingly started to see the various Russia investigations not as a, a means of figuring out what Russia did to influence our election and whether or not they had help from the Trump campaign. Over the last few months of last year, Republicans in, Cong Republicans in Congress changed course. And they increasingly started to see those congressional investigations as just a way they could help the White House develop their defense on this scandal. They, they started increasingly to use the Russia investigations in Congress as ways to create new anti-Hillary Clinton storylines to try to, you know, excite Republicans about alternate scandals they might enjoy hearing about more than the real Russia scandal. Well, over that period of time, Republicans on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, they appeared to change their mind about releasing the transcript of those 10 hours of testimony from the head of Fusion GPS. Well, last week, Dianne Feinstein, top Democrat on that committee, she just threw her hands in the air like she just didn't care. She said, forget it. You know what? This should be out there. The witness wants it out there. We had said before that we would put it out there. This is of great public interest here. She just released it on her own without permission from the rest of the committee. 312 pages, a transcript of 10 hours of testimony. And that is how we learned last week why Fusion GPS felt it was necessary to bring their research to the attention of the FBI. That's how we learned that Fusion hadn't started just looking 
at Trump in Russia. They had started looking at Trump business practices all over the world, including in Latin America and places like Scotland. That's how we learned that the origin of the steel part of the research started with uh, curiosity about Trump's business trips to Russia that never appeared to result in him actually doing any Russian business deals. So that testimony was fascinating. It was released very controversially last Tuesday by Dianne Feinstein. But that testimony, that was one of only three appearances that the founder of Fusion, Glenn Simpson, made under oath behind closed doors speaking to Congress about that dossier, what Fusion knew about the dossier's veracity and its connections with the FBI investigation into Trump's Russian contacts. The first time he testified was Senate Judiciary. His second round of testimony was before the House Intelligence Committee in November. Well, now, as of today, we've got that one, too. This one um, represents about seven hours of testimony. It didn't get leaked by anybody or, or released by anybody without permission. The, intel the Intelligence Committee actually took a vote and decided to release it. And whether or not you ended up actually going through the transcript that Dianne Feinstein released last week, whether or not you actually ended up looking at that on your own, there are two things you need to know about this new one that has just come out late this afternoon. First thing you should know is, honestly, reads like a spy novel. I read it in one sitting. You should totally read it. Uh, it's going to be cold this weekend. There's only football games on one day of the weekend. Spend the other day reading this. It's totally worth it. The other interesting thing about this transcript, or at least about the, the hearing that resulted in this transcript, is that the Republicans on this committee mostly appear to have not been there. I mean, they're definitely there at the beginning. There's questioning right off the top from Congressman Trey Gowdy, Congressman Rooney. Um, but after that, it sort of seems like the Republicans got bored and bailed. Just what seems like a couple hours into the testimony, the Republicans just don't show up anymore. I mean, there's a Republican staffer here and there that pops up to ask little tiny bursts of questions about Hillary Clinton. Right? But other than that, this is almost entirely just the Democrats eliciting information from Fusion, from the firm that commissioned the dossier. And that did their own research on Trump and Russia aside and apart from the dossier. And because the Democrats, by and large, aren't you know, they, they, don't have a, they don't have a parallel mission here. They're not distracted by trying to make this into an alternate reality scandal that somehow involves Hillary Clinton and, you know, uranium or something. Because Democrats want to talk about Russia, Glenn Simpson actually gets a ton of room to just explain his research, explain what Christopher Steele found, what his firm found, what they think it meant, why they think it was true, why they felt ne necessary to give it to the FBI. So, all right, if, if you're looking for an overall theme here, you actually get it. I think the best statement of it is right at the end of the transcript, the second to last page, at which point um, Glenn Simpson is pretty clearly exhausted. He's already said on the record at this point how tired he is. It's after 8 o'clock at night. He's been testifying all day. And I think because he's tired, he just kind of exasperatedly blurts out the big picture of how his little research firm ended up in the middle of this gigantic story. To the, the second to last page of the transcript. He says this, he says, quote, you know, we threw a line in the water. We just threw a line in the water and Moby Dick came back. <laughs> we didn't know what to do with it. In other words, they were not expecting to, to find out what they found out when they started this investigation into Donald Trump. Uh, page seven, question, what were you asked to do? Answer, it was an open-ended look at Donald Trump's business career and his litigation history and his relationships with questionable people, how much he was really worth, how he ran his casinos, what kind of performance he had in other lines of work. It was a very broad, unfocused look, which is the way we do our business. Page 23. At the very beginning of this project, one of the very first things I focused on was Donald Trump's relationship with a convicted racketeer named Felix Sater, who was alleged to have, who was alleged to have ties to organized crime. He was alleged to have an organized crime, Russian organized crime background. Over the course of this first phase of this, we developed a lot of additional information suggesting that the company that Donald Trump had been associated with and Felix Sater, Bayrock, was engaged in illicit financial business activity and had organized crime connections. We also had sort of more broadly learned that Mr. Trump had longtime associations with Italian organized crime figures. And as we pieced together the early years of his biography, it seemed as if during the early part of his career, he had connections to a lot of Italian mafia figures. But then gradually during the 90s, he became associated with the Russian mafia. 
all of that had developed by the spring of 2016 to the point where it wasn't a speculative piece of research. It was pretty well established. Page 35. Question. So during the period of time you were working for Free Beacon, remember the initial um, Fusion GPS work was paid for by a conservative group, Free Beacon, and then the later stages of it were paid for by a law firm associated with the, with the DNC, right? So question, during the period of time you were working for the Free Beacon, so the initial Republican-funded part of your research, you came across some of the first information about candidate Trump's business ties in Russia, including those with Felix Sater. Answer, yes, that's correct. And lots of other issues came up during the primaries that raised concerns in my mind about whether Trump might have unexplained connections to Russia or people involved in that part of the world. I mean, among other things, eventually Paul Manafort was appointed to his campaign as first the convention manager and then the chairman. I knew a lot about Paul Manafort from my career at the Wall Street Journal. I'd written a number of stories about his, his involvement with Oleg Deripaska and the pro-Russia party in Ukraine and another oligarch named Dmitry Firtash. I had even written a story about whether he should have registered as a foreign agent. A matter that appears later in Paul Manafort's indictment. All that had occurred years earlier. So when he suddenly surfaced in the Trump campaign, I was, you know, struck by that. Then this is Adam Schiff, Congressman Adam Schiff, questioning Glenn Simpson at this point. He says, quote, so if you would, <laughs> go through with us some of the Russia-related things that concerned you, that you learned in this first phase of your research while you were doing work for the Free Beacon. Answer. Well, the funding of Bayrock was, I think, was much of what we were initially concerned about and focused on. The company seemed to have some sort of funding source from either Russia or the former Soviet Union that was opaque. We spent a lot of time looking at the people around that and their backgrounds and why Trump would be in business with them. That was another one. That was one of the major issues. Remember, Bayrock is the firm that developed the Trump Soho with Donald Trump and his business. Another issue that surfaced was the amazing number of people from the former Soviet Union who had purchased properties from Mr. Trump, including Dmitry Rybolovyev, who purchased a derelict estate at an extreme markup in Florida. Remember the fertilizer king, Dmitry Rybolovyev? Right, on that story in particular, Congresswoman Jackie Speer of California picks up that questioning a little later on. Uh, page 124, Congresswoman Speer says, Thank you, Mr. Simpson, for being here. I'd like to focus on some of the real estate. That mansion in Florida was purchased by Mr. Trump for $41 million and then sold to Mr. Rybolovyev for $95 million. Since there had been few improvements made by Mr. Trump, what's your opinion as to why that big hike in the sale price? Simpson, well... I originally dismissed this transaction as not relevant. I'd never heard of Dmitry Rybolovyev. It seemed like an absurd acquisition, but the explanation for why he overspent was that he was hiding money from his wife. The depiction of him as a sort of reckless big spender, it was pretty thoroughly developed in the press. This guy was spending money like a drunken sailor on all kinds of things. People were ripping him off in art deals. So that was my original take on this. Later though, I began to learn more about Dmitry Rybolovyev, and that changed my view. In particular, I hadn't known that he was closely linked to Igor Sechin. Igor Sechin is a very powerful figure in the Russian government, very closely linked to Vladimir Putin. He controls Rosneft, which is the biggest oil and gas company in the world. It's the state-owned Russian gas company. So Simpson says, I didn't know Rybolovyev was closely linked to Igor Sechin and that Rybolovyev was accused of essentially destroying an entire city environmentally with his mining operations. He was criminally accused, and he managed to get out of it and walk out of Russia with billions of dollars with the apparent assistance of Sechin and Sechin's people. I am now very suspicious that he was deliberately overpaying. What we have seen is that a number of oligarchs have left Russia in recent years who seem to still be doing the bidding of the Kremlin. To some extent, they like to have an image as someone who's on the outs with the Kremlin, but when you look closely, they're not. When we looked at Rybolovyev's plane travel, you could see that he was going to Moscow all the time and that all his legal problems went away and that there were questions about whether he really did get ripped off in these art deals or whether he just said he got ripped off as a way of accounting for all the money that's missing. So I'm now of the view that this Florida transaction with Donald Trump is suspicious. Congresswoman Jackie Speer, and the additional 50 plus million dollars that Donald Trump received was for what purpose? Simpson, I don't know. I, I mean, you mean the profit from that? She says, right. And then Simpson says, well, Trump just claimed it was one of his great business deals. He just claimed he talked him into paying double, which was odd because the market was going south at that point. 
Now, again, I, I mentioned that for this hearing and for most of this transcript, the Republicans appear to have just left. I don't know if they had really important other stuff to do or if they just didn't want to participate in this conversation, but the Democrats just get to run the table because the Republicans aren't there. They get to ask Simpson about what Fusion found in its research, um, what they thought was important about it, why they believed it was true. So for big swaths of this, Simpson just gets to explain what he and his researchers found about Trump's business career that led them to believe that it was a credible allegation. When their subcontract, subcontractor, Christopher Steele, reported that the Russian government had been involved in a years-long campaign to cultivate Donald Trump and to make him essentially blackmailable by the time the presidential election rolled around. Page 95, quote, by 2003-2004, Donald Trump was not able to get bank credit. If you're a real, real estate developer and you can't get bank loans, you know, you've got a problem. Well, there's a variety of alternative systems of financing. One of the things we now know about how Trump's condo projects were financed is that you can get credit if you can show that you've sold a certain number of units. Turns out that's one of the most important things to look at. This is especially true of the early overseas Trump developments, like Toronto and Panama. You can get credit if you can show that you sold a certain percentage of your units. The real trick is to get people who say they have bought those units. And that's where the Russians are to be found, is in some of those pre-sales. That's how, for instance, in Panama, they got the credit. They got Bear Stearns to issue a bond by telling Bear Stearns that they'd sold a bunch of units to a bunch of Russian gangsters. And of course, they didn't put that in the underwriting information. They just said, we've sold a bunch of units, and here's who bought them, and here... but that's how they got the credit. That's sort of an example of the alternate financing. Page 41. What's well known and well established in criminology now is that the Russian mafia is essentially under the dominion of the Russian government and Russian intelligence services. The Russian mafia in the U.S. is believed by law enforcement criminologists to be under the influence of the Russian security services. Essentially, if people who seem to be associated with the Russian mafia are buying Trump properties or arranging for other people to buy Trump properties, it does raise a question about whether they're doing it on behalf of the government. Question. It would be known to the Russian government if it's on any substantial scale? Answer, certainly, yes. Question, might that provide the Russian government leverage vis-a-vis -vis now President Trump? Answer, yes. Question, so if, as the president's son boasted some years ago, they were getting lots of financing from Russia and that financing were illicit, that would be known to the Kremlin? Answer, yes, I think that's true. And then there's the stuff about the NRA. That's next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.